Good afternoon. My name is Asaf Atzmon. I'm a VP and General Manager for uh, the Automotive Cybersecurity Business Unit within Harman. Uh, and I'd like to start with an apology because if you had the agenda, you may have been expecting uh, someone else. Uh, so Oren Betzaleli uh, could not come today, and uh, I'm filling in for, for him. But uh, can, can we move to the next slide, please? But being in the uh, cybersecurity uh, business, I couldn't just, uh, you know, use the uh, item that I was given to talk about. What we do in cybersecurity, very often we hijack. We hijack connections, we hijack uh, privilege to the, to the OS, whatever. So I decided in uh, that nature to, to hijack the conversation and actually talk about something else. So I will talk about cybersecurity because that's what I know about. Uh, but I did ask uh, our marketing guy, you know, what, what, are, what are the main themes of this conference? I don't want to talk about things that are irrelevant. And uh, what he told me is that, you know, th talk about uh, data, talk about connectivity, talk about cloud. And I was kind of thinking how all of that relates to uh, cybersecurity. Because we typically when we talk about cybersecurity, we talk about uh, other kind of trade-offs. We talk about uh, the trade-off between security and uh, uh, you know, usability, we talk about uh, cybersecurity and safety, we don't talk so much about connectivity, and that's why I decided to call my item uh, Automotive Cybersecurity in the Speed of 5G. Uh, so uh, next, li next slide, please. And 5G has been a very big thing with uh, Harman and with Samsung over the last uh, uh, two and a half years that we've been part of Samsung. Samsung is obviously the big powerhouse of 5G in the world. You can see some of the uh, uh, metrics here, you know, uh, 7.5 uh, uh, speed record, g g uh, gigabit per second, uh, first trial in the U.S., the number of uh, households that 5G is already enabled, and uh, with uh, the combination of Samsung and, and Harman, we kind of created a new kind of perspective, a new kind of use case, which is really 5G for, for automotive, and, you know, we're one of the leaders in this space. Uh, so if you could, if you could uh, move to the next slide. And when we talk about 5G in automotive, we're actually talking about several use cases. So obviously one of them is, uh, you know, just to look at the uh, overall uh, connectivity. 5G basically gives two kind of promises, uh, a lot of speed and very low latency. And we look at what are the use cases that that can enable a connected vehicle. So some of the things that are very obvious are uh, communication between vehicles communication between the vehicle and the infrastructure and the whole idea of cellular uh, V2X, whether that's vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to network, vehicle to infrastructure. So this is uh, number one. Uh, number two is autonomous driving, right? We're talking about getting HD maps. We got, we're talking about streaming, uh, uh, uploading a lot of data for all kinds of usages. So having a very big pipe and a very speedy pipe is very important for the autonomous driving. But I think on top of that, you could actually imagine almost any kind of use case that, you, you know, if you have more speed, if you have almost zero latency, then obviously you have so many other options that uh, you can get uh, compared to uh, what you get uh, with, uh, I would say, older generations uh, uh, network. But I, would, I plan all to use 5G only as a kind of a metaphor. I'm not going to drill down into the, all the different characteristics and all the technical aspects. I just want to kind of pose the question, if you have a big pipe, if you can stream so much, a lot of data, what are the implications in terms of cybersecurity? So uh, I think that to do that, I would like first to uh, kind of break down the aspect of intrusion detection into the different steps. So when we do intrusion detection, what are the key things that we need to, to basically do? And um, these are the four steps that I kind of uh, came up with. And the first is data, right? I mean, if you want to really analyze to understand what's going on, you need a lot of data, you need access to data, you need to be able to probe it, you need to be able to extract it with what, from whatever format it exists in its raw format into something that you can make use out of, and you need to be able to very effectively stream it to the place that you want to make any kind of deduction. Second thing is analytics. So you have all the data, but that data doesn't really tell you so much about what is going on from a cybersecurity perspective. So you're starting to do all kinds of things. You're starting to aggregate it. You're starting to bring it in, into some other kind of forms. You're trying to correlate between different data sets uh, to see if uh, that correlation will allow you other kind of insights around that. And basically, you're trying to deduce what has been going on, whether something was compromised, whether an attacker got into the vehicle, how long he has been in the vehicle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera which really leads to uh, step number three, which is the actual detection. 
And many times, by the way, analytics will uh, turn out to be a false positive. So really, it looked like something happened, but nothing really happened. Maybe it does suggest some kind of an anomaly, anomaly but not necessarily a cybersecurity anomaly, not necessarily a malicious attack. And the detection phase is really what allows you to kind of boil it to uh, the actual attack that happened. And when it comes to detection, there are different techniques and they are very known in the industry. So obviously, we know a lot about sig signature matching and all the kind of antiviruses and malware detections are really trying to match signatures of known attacks into the actual data that is being observed. Uh, we can think of all kind of heuristics, uh, kind of uh, think of a uh, you know, what if uh, rule engine that trying to see if a certain uh, set of conditions have met that might suggest that that is a, spe a specific pattern of attack that we want to detect. And finally, but probably the one which the most promise is machine learning, which really giving the machine the ability to detect it uh, due to the fact that we have it before learned a lot of patterns of things that we know in advance that are attacks. So you feed it to the machine learning algorithm. Uh, there is a certain baseline that said this is a normal uh, behavior, or maybe there is a certain learning that shows these are all the kinds of attacks that we know about. And then given new kind of data, that machine learning engine would uh, uh, you know, uh, detect that that might be another kind of attack. And once you have that, then obviously the fourth step, if you can do that, is to block the attack. And I'm saying if because we'll talk about it later. In some cases, that might be already too late. But in other cases, if you're in real time, if you're able to detect uh, with a high level of uh, confidence that this is ac actually an attack, so you might have the means to block it right there and not have it propagate and, and really create the, uh, the full damage. So um, I think that when we talk about it, it's really uh, uh, useful to kind of take a page from the world of information security. So by InfoSec, I mean the kind of several decades of practice that are already available uh, by many companies in the industry to protect uh, IT systems, to protect enterprise, and to protect corporates. And, you know, uh, the, the, the aspect of uh, analytics, the aspect of understanding what's going on is, is, pretty, is pretty common today in the, in the enterprise network, but there are different ways that, that, that they do it. And I like to kind of... Uh, uh, differentiate between uh, two kind of approaches uh, that kind of work in, at the same time. The one is to put things at the end point itself, meaning to put some kind of logic on the uh, whatever I'm trying to detect, whether that's the PCs or whether that's the, uh, the mobile phones, and putting some kind of an endpoint sensor that is really uh, 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 trying to uh, figure out what's going on on that endpoint. And the other kind of sensor is what we call the network sensor, which would usually be on the routers, on the switches, on the network itself, but not really at the uh, endpoint that generate the data. Now, these two approaches are very different in the sense that uh, they, w they work in different ways because of the different kind of uh, constraints that each one has. When you see it in the endpoint, then uh, typically you really need to understand what's going on because if you just sit kind of at the output of the services, so first of all, a lot of that traffic is uh, encrypted. So you can't really read inside the traffic if you're not the one that is the one producing or, or providing the service. Secondly, if you would just try to get all that data from the host uh, upload, we're talking about huge amounts of data. It's really, it's, how, how do you even quantify all the data that the host uh, uh, produced? Whether that, you know, are these the, the processes that run? Is this the memory? Is this the, just so much data that, that you, you have to deal with? So what that drives basically is that you're really trying to, to, to do the detection locally. You, you have things as antiviruses, you have things as a malware protection or all kind of endpoint protection that really have the intelligence on the host itself at the level of the services. And when they detect something, they will probably send to the network, uh, I already found an intrusion, and if they can, they will also block it right on the spot. When we look at network sensors, they work a little differently. Uh, they're sitting in a place where they don't really understand the services themselves. They're working on levels of you know, IP networks, but they are able to capture a lot of data. So typically what a network sensor will do, it will, things like uh, NetFlow from Cisco, things around that, they will try to capture a lot of uh, data. Maybe they'll try to capture j just some aspects of the data, 
uh, coming from a specific uh, address or, or flowing through a specific port, and will basically send that data more as the raw data to the backend. And at the backend, you will have things like the security operating center and the SIM, the big database of events where companies like IBM with Curator or Splunk are uh, providing uh, uh, solutions. And you have uh, analysts that will basically try to figure out what's going on in the data. So if you kind of relate it to the four steps that w w I, I, I was showing before, you would see that you know, a network sensor will mostly focus on the data, kind of keeping the uh, analysis and the detection to the back end, and will have very little means to actually do uh, prevention other than you know, very simple uh, firewalls. But when it comes to the host base, uh, you will have most of these steps, sometimes all of these steps, right, from the data all the way to the blocking, done at the endpoint level and potentially just sending kind of the end result uh, to the backend. Now, deciding which sensors to put where and when is really uh, kind of an art in the world of information sec, and it really uh, has many considerations. Uh, this is just kind of a short list, but one of them is vantage, meaning what data you probe. There's so many data, there's so many places you, you can see it on. Are, are you sitting on the routers? Are you sitting on the endpoints? Secondly is really how much bandwidth you have. How much of the data you can stream out? Can you stream everything out? And if you cannot stream everything out, how much intelligence you have to do uh, on board uh, in order to save the data? Uh, then there's the question of where you, where you use your computing power. If you're kind of bound to local intelligence, you really need to either have a lot of compute on the host base, or kind of, uh, I would say, downgrade to more simple things such as a signature matching and, and rule set. It's very hard to kind of operate a big uh, deep learning thing uh, if you're in a very resources constrained uh, system or if you cannot really exhaust the resources of the system that you sit on. Um, can you do real-time prevention? If you cannot do real-time prevention, how much, in the, how much dependency you have on the cloud? Because if you have a lot of dependency on the cloud and I'm as a hacker can just cut the cord or do a denial of service attack that kind of disconnects you from the cloud, then all your entire architecture of detection really doesn't, is not effective anymore. And as a hacker, I can you know, do a lot of things and still keep uh, being unnoticed. Uh, whether the traffic is encrypted, can you really uh, go deep into the traffic to understand what's going on? How much, to what extent you have the connectivity? And you know, I talked about before, to what level are you prone to security attacks that would try to attack not just the system, but your own detection mechanism? So I think with that, it's worth uh, kind of thinking, what does it mean in the world of automotive? So I was talking a lot about security at large and connectivity. But I think in the world of automotive, and I, I was kind of uh, uh, dealing with that thing for, uh, I think, about six years now. And there's kind of a growing industry around automotive cybersecurity. You can just step out and see the many companies in the field but I think you can also see a certain trajectory over the years uh, that has connectivity uh, aspect to it. Because kind of in the early days, it was very clear that you cannot rely on the car to be connected. You cannot rely on the car to, be, uh, to have a very big pipe. And you have to have a lot of local intelligence. So many of the companies, us included, was really focusing on how to have something very efficient that is independent, that can deduct all of that on board and also block the, the, co uh, uh, the connection. Uh, and as we're moving into more and more connectivity, I think the kind of uh, pendulum started to change toward the more hybrid uh, architecture between the client and the server, kind of what you see here, where basically we said, all right, we can stream some of the data to the, to the backend, but we cannot stream all of the data to the backend because, you know, Every canvas generates at top something like one megabit per second. If you have 16 buses, that's already 16 megabit per second. Now moving to Ethernet, that's more traffic, looking at things you want to get from the host, from your different stacks. And definitely, as we move to the more world of ADAS and autonomous, if you just want the sensors data out, that's a lot of data. That's probably much more data than 4G can enable, and even 5G would be constrained. So you have to do all kinds of things like, all, all, like taking only part of the data, like doing things like polling, taking some partial data. And if you really want to do things like forensic, then you can really do it on one vehicle or two vehicles. And I think that what is changing is that as we move to more and more connectivity, we will start to see architectures that look more alike like the information security, where you have a, uh, let's move to the next slide, where you'll be, uh, next slide. <laughs> 
where you actually have what we call the security operating center, a center, a kind of a command and control that gets all the data, and we will see a hybrid of things. We will see things that are detected on the vehicle side because there's a, because you need to do some prevention there because there's a, you have enough compute or the right algorithm to run it on board. But at the same time, you will see a lot of data also flowing to the back end where there will be more analytics and more uh, detection done at the back end. And you know, to, that ex uh, to, that, to that aspect, uh, we at Harman are kind of uh, trying to push the envelope to, towards that hybrid architecture that on the one hand really leverage the advantages of 5G and connectivity but at the same time uh, takes consideration to the kind of different constraints that the vehicle architecture poses to, to this whole equation. So thank you very much.